Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming in the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Dozens of soldiers killed, civilian casualties. Blood has already begun to flow from Russia's attack on Ukraine. Bombs are exploding in several cities, and Russian troops are advancing on several fronts. President Putin has vowed to stop anyone who tries to interfere. While countless people are fleeing for their lives, Ukraine's military force is fighting back, and President Zelensky is calling for citizens to take up arms. CBN's Brody Carter reports on the outbreak of war in Ukraine. War sirens wailing in Kyiv before dawn, followed by early morning explosions in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Explosions reported near Kyiv and other cities across Ukraine as Russia targeted key infrastructure, military air bases, and air defense systems. <laughs> The bombing sent Ukrainians scrambling for safety. These scenes were from the port city of Mariupol. People lining up at ATMs and packing up their cars. In Kyiv, the capital, traffic backing up as far as the eye can see. Overnight, President Putin announced the beginning of Russian military operations in Ukraine, disguising his full-scale invasion as a mission to support Russian rebels in the Donbass region of Luhansk and Donetsk, land he claims belongs to Russia. Now a doorway for Russian troops into Ukrainian territory. It won't be bloodless. Uh, there will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. Ukraine's foreign ministry says they've landed in the southern port of Odessa, crossing into Kharkiv. This security footage shows Russian military crossing into Ukraine from Crimea, the peninsula seized by Russia in 2014. Ukrainian forces are fighting back in Donbass, as well as regions in the north and south. Dozens of soldiers reported dead so far, as well as civilian casualties. President Zelensky calling on Ukrainians to rise up and fight the invaders in the cities and town squares, encouraging citizens to take up arms. The country's UN ambassador delivering this message to Russia at last night's Security Council meeting. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell. Ambassador. Meanwhile, the world community is responding with promise of sanctions, but no military aid. We are banding together in strong terms to condemn these outrageous acts in the strongest possible terms. President Biden issuing a statement last night saying, quote, Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring, and the United States and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable. The president is expected to address the nation at noon today and announce crippling economic sanctions against Russia. The White House has been very clear it will not send troops into Ukraine, even to rescue Americans. However, U.S. troops are on the border with Poland and ready to help those fleeing from Ukraine. George Thomas joins us now from Ukraine. So, George, tell us what's going on there. Thousands are fleeing the evasion. They're, they're heading your direction. How are you preparing and how's the city preparing for the humanitarian crisis? 
Yeah, I, I woke up early this morning as soon as I heard that Russia had invaded and uh, pretty much went to the streets and people were, there were long lines Gordon, at the banks, at pharmacies, uh, at grocery stores. People were, were walking very fast. Some were running. You could just sense the panic, the fear. They were all on their phones. Well, let's take a look at a, a larger map to show the NATO countries that are surrounding Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, if, if NATO fighter jets, if U.S. fighter jets get involved, I mean, there's a huge risk of this turning into World War III. Uh, is, is that understood on the ground in, in Ukraine? And... Um, you know, it just, it just looks like they're just trying to completely annex Ukraine and bring it back into some kind of Russian federation. The reality is that if Russia does manage to gobble up this entire country, look at that map, they will be on the doorsteps of Poland, Hungary, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and, and in, in combination with Belarus, Belarus has some about 48,000 troops. Uh, combine those two countries and Russia taking over Ukraine, you will have Russia at the doorstep of NATO. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. This just in, out of the Jerusalem Post. Russia takes issue with Israel's sovereignty over Golan Heights and Jerusalem. Moscow took issue with Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights and Jerusalem just prior to its attack on Ukraine. Russia doesn't recognize Israel's sovereignty over Golan Heights that are part of Syria. Its deputy ambassador, Dmitry Polanski, told the UN Security Council, which held a debate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on Wednesday. The monthly Security Council meeting took place as the General Assembly debated the Russian-Ukrainian crisis. Polanski spoke just hours after Israel broke its neutrality on the conflict as it gave a nod in support of Ukraine. At the Security Council, Russia reminded Israel that it stands with Syria, where it is militarily entrenched, regarding Damascus' demand that Israel return the Golan, which the IDF captured during the defensive Six-Day War in 1967. Israel annexed the Golan in 1981, but to date, the United States is the only country that recognizes that sovereignty. Moscow also indirectly took issue with Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem, including West Jerusalem. In 2017, Moscow said it recognized West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. But Polanski appeared on Wednesday to ignore that recognition of Israel's government, using Tel Aviv as a synonym for Israel's government. It is a phrase used only by those countries who mean to convey that they do not recognize Israeli sovereignty over any part of its capital city. God gives a dire warning for the nations that come against Jerusalem, as we read in Zechariah 12.3. And it shall happen in that day, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Luke 21.25 And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Every month, Hawa Ismail and her youngest son Hamid come here to receive food assistance, help she needs to keep him and his other siblings back home fed. When we tried to farm last year, the pests destroyed it, so we couldn't produce anything. So now we rely on the food distribution to take home and cook to feed him and his siblings. Hamid is one of hundreds of children who rely on help from the UN's World Food Program in Al Fashir in Sudan's North Darfur state. Like the rest of the region, it has been devastated by years of conflict. More than 300,000 people have died and over 2 million displaced, according to the United Nations. And like the rest of the country, it's been hit by high inflation. Traders in the market say a bad harvest led to higher prices and fewer people buying. 
Farming in North Darfur was already affected by conflict in the region. Many farmers have had little to no access to their farms because of fighting involving armed groups. Farmers also blame climate change for reduced rainfall, leading to a poor harvest. All that's caused rising food prices, which many cannot afford. The World Food Program says 1.8 million people need aid to survive, up from 1.4 million last year. Nearly 400,000 of those are school children. The organization says it's trying to adapt to the needs of people, but it faces challenges. We do not have enough donations to be able to meet these challenges and provide assistance to everybody in need. And we are faced with a terrible and a tragic situation where we have to choose from who receives assistance and who does not. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Psalm 917 The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The wildfires are rapidly moving from one place to another and consuming almost everything in this area in the Argentine province of Corrientes. And firefighters are also moving fast, trying to burn a control line that will slow down the advance of the flames. Over 800,000 hectares have already been destroyed, and with it, livestock, grains and wildlife. This is an area that generally sees abundant rainfall, but strong winds, lack of humidity and drought are making it easy for fire like this one to spread all across the province. And an average of around 30,000 hectares of land are burning every day. Also at risk are 12,000 hectares of marshlands in Iberá. The area is a natural reserve where caimans, amphibians and other 300 species of birds are being affected. Firefighters from Brazil and other parts of the country like Buenos Aires have come here in an effort to prevent the fires from causing even more damage. Javier Storti is desperate. He says he has lost almost everything he owns. Most of his land was burned by the fire and, like many others, is currently in debt. Sometimes I don't want to continue, but I have to, because what am I going to tell my family? I have a family of 60 people, 19 work with me. Where's my family going to work? There's no work here aside from this. Rain is crucial at this point to prevent the fires from spreading to other provinces. But heavy rainfall is not expected until March. A long wait for those involved in the daily fight against the flames. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, 
and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. Tonight, across Colombia, abortion supporters celebrating after the nation's high court legalized abortion until the 24th week of pregnancy, some calling the move historic. Five of the nine judges voted in favor of a lawsuit that argued the previous ban discriminated against low-income women living in areas with less access to doctors and lawyers who could help them prove their pregnancy was a health risk. But not all in the predominantly Catholic country are happy about the decision. Anti-abortion activists also taking to the streets. Up to this point, abortions in Colombia were only allowed in cases of rape, fetus malformations, or when the mother's life was in danger. From 2006 to 2019, around 350 women were punished for abortions, according to advocacy organizations. At least 80 of them girls under the age of 18. I see you with your green bandana on and a smile on your face. How does it feel? We are... Thrilled. Catalina Martinez Corral is among those leading the fight for abortion rights on the ground in Latin America. Do you view this as life changing for women there? Absolutely, because today women will feel comfortable to go to the health system and they are not going to feel afraid that they are going to be accused by doctors of committing a crime. <laughs> Colombia becomes the latest Latin American country to decriminalize abortions. Mexico removing criminal penalties for abortion last year. The procedure also legal in Argentina, Uruguay, and Cuba. Where does the movement in Latin America go from here? I hope that this is going to inspire the movement to continue fighting to advance and liberalize these laws in the rest of Latin America. Is abortion murder? The Bible is clear. Murder is wrong, as stated in Exodus 20.13. You shall not murder. That being said, there are cases where killing is allowed in the Bible, as we read in Joshua 11.20. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them, as the Lord had commanded Moses. In war, soldiers don't kill for their own purposes. They kill for national interest. If they fight for an honorable nation, it will be to protect innocent civilians from some kind of threat. Murder is defined as the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. Killing is done by the judgment of one human being against another for personal reasons. The Bible condemns murder repeatedly as a characteristic of a wicked society and places a person in danger of the judgment, as we read in Matthew 5.21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. So is a fetus a human, or is it something else? Biologically speaking, human life begins at conception. No more genetic material needs to be added when the mother's egg and the father's sperm come together. They combine and create a new string of DNA that is personalized and totally unique. DNA is coded in information, the blueprint for the new human's growth and development. When a mother has an abortion, she is destroying a unique life. The Bible clearly teaches that conception is the beginning of human life, as we read in Judges 16:17. That he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Samson refers to his unborn self as having already been what God planned him to be. A Nazarite. Again, 
The psalmist King David wrote that he was wonderfully made by God in his mother's womb, as we read in Psalm 139, 13-16. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God says that he knew the prophet Jeremiah before he was in his mother's womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. King Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote about the child in a mother's womb. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God, who makes everything. A baby in the womb has feelings, as we read in Luke 1.44. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The baby, who would be known as John the Baptist, experienced the emotion of joy when Mary, being pregnant with the incarnate Jesus, entered Elizabeth's home. There have been over 61 million abortions in America since it was legalized in 1973. God's word has a lot to say about killing the innocent. Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, Seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. The Bible teaches that at conception, an unborn child is a human being that God is forming. It doesn't really matter what humans mandate is socially or politically acceptable. God's law takes precedence as we read in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. A mother who decides to abort her child is making a decision to end another person's life, and that is, and always has been, the definition of murder. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is, that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's Word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8 and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3, 15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you.
Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!